Well, the future of the Spanish government is up in the air at this hour. Drama unfolding could run to a second round of elections. And I guess a stalemate is the word of the day. Our redacted correspondent Dan Cohen is in Spain right now with a beautiful backdrop, but the drama is unfolding all around him. Dan, good to see you. What is the very latest? No government. It seems like we could be headed for a, a massive amount of uncertainty there. Yeah, it's even less clear now than it was uh, in the in the final days leading up to the election. Basically, what's happened is that neither the center-right popular party nor the center-left socialist party have any clear path to power. Essentially, uh, the, 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 the socialist party um, uh, needs, both, both parties need to form a coalition in order to take power. Neither of them have anywhere near enough votes to win outright. So the, the socialist party would have to uh, ally with not only Sumar, which is the left-wing party that uh, was an offshoot of the Podemos party that emerged in the, uh, from the Occupy movement, um, but it would also have to build an alliance with the Catalan nationalist movement, which is based out of where I am, which uh, a, an independence or separatist movement that does not want to be a part of Spain. So there's an obvious contradiction there that this Spanish party would have to ally with a group that doesn't even want to be part of the state or part of uh, a government. And it's and this and the uh, they've specifically said they've explicitly said this Catalan Nationalist Party has said that uh, our our priority is to have independence and uh, to have our leader, Carlos Puigdemont, who is in exile, pardoned, brought back to Spain, and the political prisoners freed, released from prison as they've been criminalized. So for Pedro Sanchez, the leader of the Socialist Party, to make some kind of agreement with uh, the Catalan Nationalists would be politically extremely difficult um, and maybe even political suicide. Then you have the center right wing party, the popular party they're called, that would have to make an alliance with Vox, which is the far right party, um, which even they're hesitant to do because of Vox's embrace of um, Spain's uh, ugly history, the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. Uh, who was in in power from 1939 until 1975 when he died. Um, so neither of these parties have any clear path to victory. And so there's talk about, yeah, there will be even a possible second uh, election. And you know, that could be even a year away. So we're looking at the possibility of Spain being without a government for at least an entire year. Vox was supposed to perform much better than it did the far right party was supposed to perform much better what do you think happened there i think in part vox's poor turnout is because a lot of voters who uh would have voted for vox voted for the popular party to sort of play it safe in the same way that happened with uh the the left-wing parties where people who might have voted for sumar said oh we're gonna play it uh, safe and and vote for the the PSOE the the Socialist Party similar to how you know people who might have voted for like Bernie Sanders in a previous election in the U S voted for Hillary Clinton and well we saw how that turned out but um, I mean the New York Times has pretty much declared that Vox is dead in the water uh, but only a couple months ago there were regional elections throughout Spain and and Vox did remarkably well so while it didn't do well at the at the national level. At the regional level, it did very well. In fact, I was just in a village in the south of Spain, in Andalusia, called uh, Puente de Genave, and we got an exclusive interview with the new Vox mayor, who uh, who came to power in an outright majority. So, and it and it shocked really everyone, shocked the media, and shocked him. So it's kind of like a, a Brexit moment, so that sort of thing. So that so the Vox phenomenon is very much still alive um it's just that there's a there's a there's also a, a sort of a stigma attached to vox uh in the national consciousness because it has really embraced the legacy of the spanish dictatorship uh the spanish dictator francisco franco 
who, you know, it's, it's illegal. It's actually illegal to praise him here and, 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 you know, to, to, to openly support him. So, but Vox is sort of trying to break that taboo, but, you know, despite the differences of all of these different parties from Vox to Sumar to the popular party, none, even the, even the, the Catalan nationalists, all of them are pro, uh, pro NATO. Um, none of them really want to split or, or, or think about the multipolar world. Um, so, you know, the, I mean, on, on paper, they appear to be bitter enemies. And, you know, in this kind of parliamentary, parliamentary democracy, where you have so many parties competing and making alliances, they are all on the same wavelength when it comes to the relationship to the United States. So I think you kind of see the just all these contradictions in Spain's you know, a Western liberal democracy like Spain, but there is actually, you know, very, there's no real, there's not any real choice outside of the neoliberal model um, supporting Ukraine, the Ukraine war, um, you know, following the U.S.'s lead on all things international and, and the like. It is interesting to see. I thought maybe we would see more of a, a nationalist move throughout Europe. I know the New York Times and others have said, hey, this is a sign that, no, globalism is still alive and well, that the EU bloc is still strong, that there's not this great move like in Italy towards a Georgia Maloney and uh, moving away from the United States, really uh, clamping down on a multipolar world. No, see, the unipolar world is still alive and well, according to the New York Times and, and Euronews and others, uh, really uh, celebrating this idea that the right wing in Spain didn't have a clear victory. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the thing that I would, it's like, even if the the Vox did come to uh, power, you know, was was the second biggest party or something like that, got into the government and had prominent positions. You know, Vox is critical of the EU. Um, it's very critical of, it. Ta they talk a lot about the UN Agenda 2030, for example. Um, so in the sense of, of that aspect of globalism, they are critical, but they're not critical of NATO. Um, which so it seems like sort of a contradiction. And if you look at the origins of Vox, um, they were they came in 2013. They splintered off from the Popular Party, the kind of center right Popular Party, um, with money funding from the MEK, the Iranian opposition like cult that is very close to the United States and to Israel. So it's it is it is a nationalist movement, but I think it's a kind of fake uh, opposition to the kind of unipolar U.S.-led order um, that, you know, maybe it, it sells well to certain uh, segments of the Spanish population, but it doesn't represent a fundamental break with the unipolar order, with globalism, and, you know, would look to, well, why don't we have um, alliances with different countries? Why don't we talk to Russia? Why don't we talk to China? Even though there's still, you know, the New York Times and the mainstream media will still say that uh, Vox is supported by Russian propaganda and all this stuff, but they're they don't criticize the Ukraine war at all. So it's kind of funny in that way. Well, I think it's similar to what we saw. Again, I bring up Italy with Georgia Maloney, like this idea. Well, we're really going to be separating ourselves from this. They're going to really criticize the Ukraine war. They're really going to step away from this uh, this this unipolar uh, world order. Step away from the United States, and of course, that hasn't happened. And there's been quite a bit of criticism. Uh, leveled against Georgia Maloney, maybe sort of this fake nationalism that's emerging through Europe right now. Dan Cohen is in Spain for us. Thank you so much for being in the heart of the drama, and we really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Clayton. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.